In today's video, you're going to see some very interesting wildlife, including a pedophobiac's worst nightmare and the real-life Silent Hill. But first, let's take a look at this fungus that survives in the most inhospitable place in the entire world. The Radiation-Eating Fungus Okay, let's be honest here. Can you just imagine finding a writhing, squid-like mutant creature looking in your basement, much like the creature in this photo? I know it'd be terrifying, but fear not, this is just some digital artwork posted by somebody over on Reddit. Good job there, buddy. According to the caption, it's basically the artist's interpretation of what a worm would look like when it was subjected to the intense radiation present at Chernobyl. Fact is, there are quite a number of mutant creatures roaming around the outskirts of the once buzzling city, but no giant mutant worms have been found thus far. I mean, really, it's not Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl still. This is understandable, given the high levels of radiation released during the meltdown, no living creature could have survived near the reactor itself. Not until something shocking was discovered just recently. Scientists have actually discovered a species of fungi that is living inside Chernobyl's reactor number 4, a damaged reactor where radiation levels are still dangerously high. The fungi wasn't only living there, they were actually thriving there. That alone seems pretty remarkable, but what's even more remarkable is this. After subjecting the fungi to a series of tests, scientists learned that the stuff would actually grow faster when exposed to high levels of ionizing radiation. What that basically means is that the fungi are essentially feeding on the radiation. It's amazing to see a great example of nature's resiliency in the face of what essentially is unlivable conditions, even if the implication's a little horrifying. Next, we have dolls, and I mean a lot of dolls. Years of watching horror movies have taught me a few things. One is when you find yourself and a few of your friends trapped inside an old, dilapidated house with a killer on the loose, never ever split up and start exploring by yourselves. The other lesson is that old, broken, dirty dolls are the stuff of nightmares. Now, there isn't any mad killer roaming the deserted streets of Chernobyl, that I know of, but this abandoned nuclear ghost town has creepy dolls and lots of them. Pripyat in particular is full of these broken dolls, so many so that there almost seems to be some weird horror movie creepy doll mad scientist cloning program going on somewhere in town, most likely in the vicinity of the sarcophagus, which is one of the many creepy things we're going to talk about in a bit. But for now, back to the dolls. Everywhere in the city, you can count on dolls staring creepily at you. They sit on windowsills, they're propped up on skeletal bed frames, they're sprawled out in piles of debris, and some people have even fitted them with gas masks. And while it's certainly tempting to think that everything you see in Pripyat is still in pretty much the same spot where it was left on the day of the evacuation, it's actually more likely that it's just tourists looking for an awesome photo. This is done to maximize the creep factor in the Instagram photos and also try to get more likes. Some dolls may not even be from Pripyat itself, as a lot of the dolls look almost brand new, which suggests that tourists are mostly just bringing them along for the sake of Instagram. It does make sense, though. It's a weird practice, but it makes sense. I mean, really, nobody's gonna care and get jump-scared if they see an old doll in someone's closet. But when it's staring at you from the branches of a dead tree... Let's all just pause for a moment to indulge in a collective shudder. Next, let's talk about the sarcophagus. No, I'm not talking about the elaborate wooden coffins used by ancient Egyptians to bury their pharaohs in, and honestly, finding one of those in the middle of a nuclear disaster zone would be weird. I'm talking about the massive structure built to contain the failed nuclear reactor, preventing the radiation from within to escape. The structure has been called the sarcophagus, and it is the largest object ever moved by humans. There are, in fact, two of them, with the first one being built in 1986, and that original structure did its job very well. At least for a few decades. Until it was discovered that it wasn't really doing the job well enough, as evidenced by the multitude of mutated animals in the entire area. By the 2010s, the structure started to fall and crumble, posing the risk of releasing a massive amount of deadly nuclear radiation into the world. The old sarcophagus is being dismantled as we speak, and the demolition job should be finished by 2023. Hopefully, at least. But, I hear you scream, wouldn't that release the radiation? Well, yeah, it will, but engineers aren't way ahead of you on that. A second, even larger sarcophagus was built in 2016 to encase its falling older brother before demolition began. Building both sarcophagi wasn't a walk in the park, though. According to the BBC, workers assemble the original sarcophagus in shifts, lasting five to seven minutes each because longer shifts might have actually killed them instantly. This instead of dying a long, painful, agonizing, cancer-ridden death much later in life. Next, we have one creepy carnival. Pripyat was a town just a mile and a quarter away from the failed reactor, so you can just imagine how intimidating the sarcophagus looks from here. 
But hey, you want something creepy and daunting? You wouldn't have to look far. This is because within Pripyat itself lies an abandoned place that's gonna give you chills. I'm talking about, of course, Pripyat's famous abandoned amusement park. Since Pripyat houses most of the people working at the nuclear power plant, the park was built to cater to those people and their families. And since Pripyat became a ghost town literally overnight, the remains of this once place of fun and relaxation remains basically the same as the day it was built. Although time and disrepair admittedly added some creepy charm over the place. According to Atlas Obscura, Pripyat's amusement park was supposed to open on May 1st, which is five days after the disaster at the Chernobyl nuclear plant. But because the townspeople needed something to do while the nuclear reactor was melting down and their homes were slowly filling up with deadly radiation, Soviet officials were kind enough to open the amusement park early, on April 27th. Woohoo? Well, either way, to this day, it remains the only amusement park to have opened for only one day. The modern day version of this amusement park can be deadly. Some of the rides malfunction sometimes, turning what should have been an enjoyable moment into a downright tragedy. There's a special kind of horror about an amusement park ride that goes swooping in and out a cloud of radiation. It sort of gives new meaning to the phrase, thrill ride. Our next little tidbit is surprisingly thriving wildlife. Yeah, logic states that life, and any form of life, would find it impossible to live, much less thrive in an area as radioactive as Chernobyl. But surprise, surprise, nature has still found a way, and a thousand square mile region around Chernobyl is actually teeming with life. Again, this isn't stalker or fallout, so they're not all mutated monstrosities with multiple eyes, heads, they're really just regular old animals. Don't even talk. Kinda boring, really. I was a bit disappointed too when I found out that Chernobyl wasn't being called home by three-eyed goldfish, but in the earlier years after the nuclear meltdown, there were mutated animals in the area. Ten years after the horrible incident, both the wild animals and the domestic ones left behind were indeed affected, having been born with major birth defects such as multiple heads, muzzles, and legs. They also found other defects, such as a cat with two faces, a lamb with eight legs, a two-faced calf, and another calf with legs growing from its back. But mutated animals are all but gone now, and wildlife has come back to the area. In fact, scientists around the world were completely surprised to find that the wildlife in the exclusion zone came back much sooner than they had predicted, and life seems to be doing well considering the circumstances. Many researchers thought that life would take decades, maybe centuries, to come back from the accident. But it didn't, and animals are doing rather well for the most part today. Next, we have the Bloody Red Forest. It's not only humans and fauna that have been adversely affected by the radiation. The plant life was as well, and anyone could argue that they fared much worse in comparison. The Bloody Red Forest is a set of woodland where all the pine trees turned to blood red color right after the meltdown. The trees died not long after, but here's the disturbing part of this place. Even decades after the disaster, these dead trees are still standing and not decaying. Think of them as everlasting zombies, but trees rather than rotting corpses. Because of this strange phenomenon, scientists decided to run some tests. They filled specially prepared garbage bags with leaf litter from uncontaminated areas, taking care that there were no insects or decomposers present, and then leaving the bags out in both contaminated and uncontaminated wooded areas. They were left for a year in the exclusion zone. Afterwards, they gathered the bags. The bags left in uncontaminated areas acted as expected, with 70% to 90% of the leaves decomposing leaves in contaminated areas retained 60% of their original weight, which basically indicated that the natural decomposers weren't doing their thing. This suggests that the radiation exposure has had a detrimental effect on the ability of the Chernobyl ecosystem to replenish itself with nutrients. This in turn could be contributing to the stunted tree growth also reported in the area around Chernobyl. These blood-red, dead but still standing trees are a marvel to look at, but they inherently pose a major problem. The fact that the leaves in the contaminated area stayed intact and dry even after almost a year could present a fire hazard. This in turn presents the danger of radioactive contaminants being spread outside of the exclusion zone by forest fires. Next we have the Grandmas of Chernobyl. When disaster struck, the Soviet government evacuated 116,000 people. They eventually put most of them over in apartments outside the exclusion zone. The thing is, some of the residents, especially those from smaller villages within the exclusion zone, weren't interested in leaving. You have to realize one thing. A few things, actually. These villagers survived Joseph Stalin and the Nazis, and they weren't about to run away from something unseen like deadly radiation. Within a few years, some have actually decided to return to their old homes. Of course, the government at the time greatly opposed this, but eh, what could you do? I mean, try to order your grandma around and tell me what you get out of it. About 1,200 people moved back into the exclusion zone in the months and years following the disaster. 
They've since been called the self-starters, and most of them were in their late 40s, and of the handful that still survive today, about 80% are female. It's also not ignorance that's forced them back into their homes. The risks involved in such an undertaking has been thoroughly explained to them. They know the soil is contaminated, but that small detail hasn't stopped them from growing crops. They raise chickens and hogs, despite the real dangers of eating meat that's been raised in the exclusion zone. Many of them are in their 70s or 80s, and they're still mostly healthy. Basically, that's all they need. That and being tough, stubborn babushkas. Perhaps they just beat the radiation off with a stick whenever it gets too close. Next, we have Dark Shadows. Pripyat's residents have long been gone, but their memories remain in the abandoned town. No, I'm not talking about the long-forgotten possessions that they abandoned at the drop of a dime, but rather some dark, somewhat disturbing artwork left there by rogue artists. Rogue, because instead of staying away from a nuclear disaster zone, which is what people would most likely do, these artists forcibly break into the place with the purpose of, for lack of a better term, spruce up the place. Reportedly coming mostly from places like Belarus and Germany, dark graffiti artists over time have slowly stormed the exclusion zone with their arsenal of multicolored spray paint cans and left their artistic works there. These artworks are hauntingly beautiful, and some are likewise disturbing, and they've also left it all around the surrounding area. Needless to say, they completely ignored the warnings about deadly radiation. Some of the more dramatic graffiti is in the city of Pripyat. These artists portrayed silhouettes of the missing residents of the abandoned city who were evacuated the day after the accident on the 27th of April 1986, never to return. For instance, in one building, there's a small girl with little bows in her pigtails depicting reaching up for a light switch. Outside, though, there's a small boy pulling his toy truck and looks to be peeking around a corner as if to surprise someone. In other buildings, walls are adorned with silhouettes of people looking as though they're dancing, yet in another, three kids are frozen in mid-air, as if having just jumped from an unseen trampoline, and floating while holding each other. Could be in joy, could be in terror, but I'll leave the interpretation up to you. By the way, the obvious reference to the nuclear shadows left in Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the nuclear bomb attack on Japan is thought to be not a coincidence. Next, we have one creepy hospital. This one really does remind you of Silent Hill. Located in the micro-district of Pripyat on Drusby Naradov Street is the Pripyat City Hospital No. 126. It had 410 beds with clinics and outpatient facilities fanning out that were interconnected. Complete with a dental clinic, maternity ward, infectious disease clinic, and a morgue, it seems that this hospital was ready to handle any medical emergency imaginable. Thing is, they never imagined that the horrific events of April 26, 1986 would actually happen. All the victims of the meltdown, all 237 plant workers, firefighters, and soldiers ended up being treated for severe radiation poisoning in this very hospital, many to never leave here alive. According to a 2006 World Health Organization report, 28 firemen and rescue personnel died within the first three months. The victims' clothes were so irradiated that they had to be taken to the basement of the hospital, and they still remain there to this day. Eventually, victims were taken to Moscow, the only place in the old Soviet Union where there was a facility that could handle radiation victims. Today, hospital documents and rotting medical equipment fill the hospital's otherwise empty halls. The hospital's basement is the most radiated location in the city, and had to be abandoned within just days of the incident. A lot of people believe that the place is haunted, especially in circles that are neck deep in the paranormal. In fact, the program Destination Truth allegedly discovered multiple human-like figures moving through frame and video surveillance taken of the hospital. Next, we have the Gas Mask Room. From a creepy hospital, let's now go to a school that's equally, or perhaps even more, unnerving. Middle School Number 3, yes. Naming conventions of the old Soviet Union lack a certain amount of creativity, so to speak. Either way, this particular middle school has something you wouldn't normally associate with schools, gas masks. In fact, the school has the most photographed collection of gas masks in all of Pripyat. One of the rooms is also practically carpeted with gas masks, and because it's Pripyat, there is also a gas mask wearing doll propped on a stool in the middle of the room. It just wouldn't make sense in a different place. Standing in the middle of a school room filled with gas masks really gets your imagination going. I feel like what you're seeing in your head is a pretty horrific scene involving crowds of panicked kids trying to put on their gas masks as a heavy cloud of radiation swoops into the room. But as is always the case with things like these, the truth isn't near as dramatic. Most of those gas masks were in storage at the time of the disaster and were probably never taken out by anyone who worked at or attended middle school number three. More than likely, they were placed there months or even years later. All the mask filters are gone, likely removed by looters hoping to salvage the small amount of silver inside. 
This does give the disturbing thought of someone out there probably eating his or her meal using radioactive Chernobyl silverware. Finally, we have the unlikely tourist hotspot. The most shocking things to ever be found inside the Chernobyl exclusion zone are, of course, humans. Tourists, to be more specific. You see, there is a thing now called dark tourism, and Chernobyl and Pripyat are two of its top destinations. In commemoration of the 35th anniversary of the historic tragedy, the Ukraine International Airlines started offering aerial tours of the exclusion zone, giving their passengers a unique view of the abandoned nuclear power plant and the city of Pripyat for around 106 US dollars. Their ticket gets them a seat with a panoramic view of the city and the exclusion zone from just above the minimum allowed altitude of 3,000 feet above. Also, people get a chance to take a selfie with the pilot. Also, there are ground-based tourism there. You can actually see the Chernobyl control room and reactor number four, but a hazmat suit is required, making aerial tours an instant hit with tourists with the premiere selling out in two days. In 2019, a total of 104,000 tourists visited Chernobyl, whereas in 2020, only 32,000 actually did. Not because people already wisened up to the dangers of such a trip, but rather world conditions around that time weren't, uh, let's not just say, uh, really conducive for traveling. Chernobyl and Pripyat continue to be visited illegally in spite of all the dangers. That includes the threat of very large fines that can be levied against those who get caught engaging in their dark obsession. See you all next time!